where the murder of genocide of women and children that the soldiers were told that this is the word of God that this is the word of God a war of God a holy war just came out in that in that show called religious uh, uh, a show that talks about all religions as uh, a report that came out and this was in New York City true to your word killing in mass women and children without caring to humanity in your Bible and you call Muslims the wars with the Muslims you know how many died in total with Muhammad who fought only to f fight for his own survival they were being impacted by the Christians by the Jews by the Arabs by the other empires God said listen if you don't fight now Islam will never be established you will all die now fight so whenever you see verses in the Quran that say to fight war you fight to win, not to lose, do you? And the Quran says, but if your enemy inclines toward peace, incline toward peace to them. I challenge my, my learned uh, opponent to find me one verse in the Bible, where in the Old Testament, where after the killing and genocide, where God says, now seek peace. There's even Jizza in the Bible, in the book of Deuteronomy. This is commanded by Jesus Christ, whom you call God. Remember, if you call him God, you got to take the whole package. You just can't say he was God then, but wasn't God then. God now, but not then. He inspired me. No, you say he's God. He inspired your book. You say it. So therefore, if you accuse Islam of, of murder, Islam and war, and being violent, Islam has never started one war, to, world war in the history of mankind, while Christian Western civilization was responsible for the death of over 175 million people in the last 160 years. Now that's a historical fact. It wasn't Muslims that killed six million Jews. In fact, the Jews called their greatest time in their history. The golden age of Judaism was where? Under Muslim rulership in Spain. And who was killing the Jews and subjugating them? Christians. Christians. And when the Muslims came, the Jews called it their golden age. Jobs, government, life, scholarship. The Muslims, because they protected the people of the book, but unfortunately, we don't get in history what we gave. And God has ordained this. But unfortunately, the Muslim expects the same kindness that was done to him, to, to, that was done to him, to, that he did to others, to be done to him. But it's not reciprocal. Because when you tell the truth, there's a price to be paid. Jesus will tell you. Moses will tell you. Abraham will tell you. Muhammad ibn Abdullah will tell you that there's a price to be prayed Thank you. for speaking the truth. Yep. Sadiq, do you know for a fact that Islam is true? That Islam is true. Do you know that for a fact? Um, do I know that for a fact? In my heart, my soul, and what is given to me, to this individual, to this creation of God, that which I believe now is a fact to me. And how do you know that that's a fact? It's a fact because it speaks to me of the oneness of God. It speaks to me of, of a relationship, of how I can have a relationship with the God who created me. It was in the same way that I believe, from my former experience as a Christian, that Jesus Christ used in order for himself to communicate with God. He spoke to God and said, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And when I pray as a Muslim, I pray directly to God. I do not go to a middle man. I pray directly to him in the manner and the style of Jesus Christ and all the prophets of God. I go to my knees and I bend on the ground. And I worship and I love God. And this to me seems entirely in connection with God and entirely in connection with the teachings of the prophets. Okay, so my response to what you are saying is that the religion resonates with your heart, but I did not hear any proof or facts or evidence that it is true. That is my response. Okay, I, when I hear um, my opponent speak, I, I never heard facts about it his religion, how he came about it. But anyway, um, my question is, again, with the book of Matthew, I believe it's Matthew, where Jesus Christ again speaks about the resurrection of, of Lazarus from the dead. My question is, what do you get from that verse that suggests to you that Jesus is God from the whole story of, of, of Lazarus, the entire chapter when it talks about Lazarus? What is it within that chapter that suggests to you that Jesus is himself God and that he acted independently as only God can do. Okay, the parable, which, which is in the Gospel of, of Luke, actually, uh, the parable of Lazarus, we do not expect that 
every time Jesus taught or gave a parable that he was calling himself God because Jesus taught about many different things. When he told the story of the rich man and Lazarus, in this story, this rich man was, was sent to hell and he tried to ask Abraham if he could be resurrected from the dead to warn his evil brothers. Abraham said they have the Bible. And he, they, they called the Bible the Law and the Prophets back then. That's the phrase they used. And he says, well, um, they don't believe in the Law and the Prophets, but if somebody rose from the dead, they'd believe me. And then Abraham said, listen, if they don't believe in the Law and the Prophets, neither will they believe if somebody raises from the dead. So there's nothing in that parable which tells me Jesus is God. What does tell me that Jesus was God is that he called himself God in another part of the Bible in John 8:53. And in John 8, 53, Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. Now, even in those days, that would have been incorrect grammar, except that I am was the name that God gave to Moses at the burning bush when Moses said, tell me your name. And just in case there's any doubt that that's exactly what Jesus meant, the Jews listening to him picked up stones to stone him for calling himself God. There are many verses like that. So, but just because in one place of the Bible, Jesus is talking about a different subject, doesn't mean that elsewhere he was not claiming to be God. First of all, I don't see that verse of Jesus Christ saying, I am saying he's God. I see, he said, I am before. He said it to the woman, to the woman who, he washed his, who washed his feet at the well. She said, sir, I perceive you to be a prophet. And then she said, but he that comes, he shall guide us into all light and truth. He shall know. He shall tell us. She said, Jesus said, I am. Who is Jesus referring to there? The Messiah. Again, I stress to you. The Messiah, the chosen anointed of God. This is what he was saying. I guess Jesus had a problem with expressing that because even his disciples had a problem. Because if they didn't have a problem, they would have known who Jesus Christ was when he came to them after the crucifixion, supposedly. They wouldn't have been scared. From my, they explained to my disciples the secrets of the parables. Oh no, had they known, had my disciples known that I was of this world, they surely would have fought for me. And that allowed me to fall into the hands of the Jews. So he said they knew. But why were they scared when they saw Jesus and ran? If it had already been made clear to them that they knew that he was not of this world. So you see, Good. the inconsistencies are incredible. Sadiq, if today's Bible is inaccurate, why do you quote from it? And what is your measuring stick to know what is or is not accurate in today's Bible aside from dismissing verses that contradict the Quran. Other than the fact that some verses contradict the Quran, what is your objective measuring stick to decide which verses in the Bible are true and which are not? The Quran says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, this is a scripture sent down to protect the scripture that came before it in truth. Yes, God did protect the Bible. He protected it with the Holy Quran. So therefore, that which is in the Bible, which is in agreement with the Quran, I consider to be truthful. That which is not, I do not. The writers of the Bible itself have problems as to the, the authenticity of the Bible and warn against people messing with it. In fact, in the book of Revelation, I believe it's chapter 19, John writes, in my words, because I can't say verbatim, don't mess with what I write or there will be consequences. So he knew that it was a, there was a tendency to mess with the word of God. Book of Jeremiah chapter 8 verse 8 says, How can you call us holy when the Bible has been corrupted by the pen of the secretaries of the scribes? How can you call us good? You see, there was already in the Bible, besides even Paul warning, a tendency, what is called pious fraud, to change with authority from God, to change the word, supposedly by men, to change the word of God. From pious fraud. We do it for good reasons. For good reasons, for our hearts are pure. But see, your heart is not purer than the heart of God. So God tells you, don't mess with what I write on the book. But it was messed with. And the Quran comes as a protection of that scripture and lets me know what's good in the Bible and what is not. So if I'm following this logic, the Quran claims to be a sequel to the Bible, but the Quran looks to be in dispute when it contradicts the Bible. But the only way you get around the contradictions is you say when the Quran and the Bible contradict, the Bible is in error. In any realm of educated study, that would be called circular reasoning. When Jesus Christ says, unto my disciples, I have explained the secrets of the parables and I've explained to them the secrets of the kingdom of God. In other words, this is God speaking if you're a Christian. 
not a Muslim. We believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah and the prophet of God, servant of God. This is a Christian thought. If Jesus, the God-man, inerrant in his word and inerrant in his life, if he said, I have explained the secrets of the parables to my disciples, I've explained to them the secrets of the kingdoms of God, the kingdom of God. Why did they doubt Jesus and run away from him when he came and appeared for them, to them after the crucifixion, especially in the light of that Jesus Christ said, had my disciples known that I was of this world, makes it very clear, they surely would have fought for me and not allowed me to fall into the hands of the Jews. Now, if you could answer that and also address the fact that why if they knew that, that they shouldn't fight for him because he wasn't, the, why did Peter cut off the ear of the guy if he knew that Jesus wasn't of this world? 